Welcome back to the Van Diemen Formula Ford restoration. And on this episode, we need to tidy up some loose ends. Up to this point, we've done a great job of fitting some of the bigger components, but we need to get in and fit some of the smaller parts that make the big components work. And I think first up, what we need to do is get the brake lines on this and get the brakes bled. We've fitted the brakes in a previous episode, but we need to run the hydraulics now. We need to get all the plumbing sorted so we can fill the master cylinders, make sure we have no leaks and we can get a good brake pedal. When we got the brake calipers rebuilt, I requested a full set of new banjo bolts. The old banjo bolts were rounded, some of them had ground heads, and the majority not only had damage, but had a lot of corrosion inside them. For the sake of a couple of dollars, we've thrown them away and we've, we've, we've replaced them. I've been through the box of parts and I've found what I assume is all the old brake lines, and I can see without looking too hard that they're damaged. One's crushed and kinked, the other one's obviously had a hole in it and I've just cut the bit of damaged pipe out and put a joiner in it. Either way, we'll still lay these out, have a good look at them, but I can't see us reusing these brake lines. I think I've figured out where all these brake lines go and this one here is an easy find. Because of that, it's got the speed sensor on it that used to fit to the front left tire and that's the plug that goes in through the center of the car. So it's got a banjo bolt from the master cylinder then a banjo bolt for each of the brake calipers. So this is actually quite straightforward. What we used to do a lot back in the day is use sheathing or heat tape or, or whatever, heat shrink even, on the braid. And that was to stop damage, to stop impacts from stones or debris flicked up from other cars that could damage the braid or even damage the Teflon in a liner. We don't do that anymore. We find that it holds in too much garbage that brake dust or road debris will get through the stainless braid and start to wear away on the Teflon inside. So just because of that, because we can't necessarily see all the damage that's going on, we're gonna replace the hoses just to be safe. We will not put the sheathing back on, we will leave it just a raw braid. So it's easy, easy to visually inspect and we don't expect any damage from what this car should do it shouldn't see the service life that these brake lines have. These brake lines have probably been on it for, for a million years. So it's time to change them. We, we're not gonna reuse them. We might reuse the ends just because we can, but we're gonna remake all the brake lines on this car. I've got myself a roll of Dash 3 Teflon braid, which hopefully is enough to do this complete car. I'm not going to assume that these brake lines are the right length because I want a nice fit. So what we will start to do is we'll start at the middle from the brake master cylinder, we'll build some hoses, we'll run them out to the brake calipers and see how they sit. I think we're gonna reuse the fittings off the original front brake lines. They actually look really good. And all I need to do to reuse them is to replace the olives. I've got a bag of them. We've got more than enough to do the car. And you can see by that shot how this works. The Teflon hose slips over the spout on that banjo fitting. The olive locks that into position and then that jam nut tightens the olive onto the Teflon line and they generally never leak, never give problems, and will certainly never pull out. They're a, they're a really great setup. So what I'm gonna do now is get one of the ends on, we'll get it fitted into the car, lay it into where it's gotta go, and hopefully we can get this length right, and then just work across the front and get this front brake line sorted. I've fitted the hose off to the master cylinder and then laid the hose where I want it to run loosely. I've got the fitting on the brake caliper so I know exactly where it's got to go. So all I need to do now is put the hose where I want it, cut it to length, and then I can put that end on. The front brake lines are finished, tightened up and fitted to the car. 
we've left enough slack at each end that the brake hose won't get caught at any, any of the pinch points of the car. There's also enough there for the wheels to turn lock to lock. And even where it comes through in here, it's on top of a suspension mounting point, so we need to make sure we're clear of that and we're not rubbing hard on any parts of the car. But the front's done, it only makes sense that now we do the rear of the car. The rear is a little bit different if it's a single hose all the way back to the middle of the gearbox where it goes into a T, then out each side to the rear brake calipers. So let's get into that. The original rear brake line that went from the master cylinder to the gearbox was the piece that had that join in it. So we're gonna replace the hose and use the new stuff that we've got. It runs inside the car, next to the driver's feet, inside the radiator, and then across the back of the engine and up the side of the bell housing. So we need to get that fitted up as neatly as possible. Also, next up, we'll put the clutch line in. So it'll be run alongside. So all the hoses will come down one side and be protected and tied up neatly to make sure they're away from anything that could cause them damage. And that is now the rear brakes finalised. Both braided hoses go to the T above the gearbox, just in front of the dry sump tank. And then the single line runs all the way to the mast cylinder at the front. Now, while we're going, we might as well do the clutch. The clutch will run along the same as that single hose through the inside of the car and just terminate here where the starter motor is at the start of the bell housing. And it only makes sense that while we're making hoses, we get that done and finished off. Now that we've got the brake lines plumbed to all four brake calipers and the clutch, the next thing we're gonna stick on is this thing. What does this do? This is for the brake bias adjustment. For those of you who saw the edit episode when we put all the pedals in this, will know exactly what I'm talking about. And it's got a threaded rod at the side of it that the end of this goes onto so the driver can have adjustment on where the brake bias is at, should he want to adjust from front to rear he can just simply turn this knob, it's got detents in it and it clicks, so it locks into position. But this, we're gonna get this in next and then we're gonna get some brake fluid in this, bleed these brakes up. The brake bias adjusters in the car is located here, right next to the steering wheel. It's very convenient for the driver just to take his hand off the wheel to give it a turn. It's, everything's very user friendly in its placement between that and the gear stick. The cable just sort of runs down there. You can't attach it to anything because the whole cable turns as you turn the dial. That's transferred to the threaded rod inside the brake pedal and moves that bias ball left to right or front to rear, depending on what you're after and what you need from the car. Now that's in, works a treat. If I turn that, it turns it at the pedal. That's exactly how it should be. It's now time for us to put some brake fluid in this thing. And of course we use the KCK brake fluid, that goes without saying. But what you probably have noticed while we're doing the hoses is the length difference between the hose. We've got a very short hose at the front there and the rear of the car is probably five times that length. And what you want when you first apply that brake pedal is even distribution of the pressure. You don't want it to lock the wheel with a shorter hose and be slower on the wheel with a longer hose for it to get its pressure. And that's why we've worked so hard to get a proper low viscosity brake fluid that of course has the high boiling point you would expect from a performance brake fluid. But another benefit is this doesn't attract the moisture anywhere near as much as the other products. By its chemical makeup, it doesn't attract the moisture. So it lasts a lot longer, there's no corrosion, and 
when you add moisture to the brake fluid, it reduces the boiling point. So it's, it's a proper long life brake fluid. And we leave it in a lot of cars for so long that the, the guys actually freak out. But it's just, it's the best product for the job and that's exactly why we use it. But now we're gonna tip some of this in here and see if we can bleed these brakes up and get a good pedal. Yes, we've got the brake fluid in there now. The master cylinders are full and we're just gonna wait a second just to make sure those master cylinders don't leak. But I'm pretty confident in the guys that they've done a good job of those. A little trick that a lot of these guys use in these sorts of cars is puts a bit of foam inside the master cylinder. And this is only to stop that brake fluid sloshing out of the cap. Because of the bumps and the G-forces and everything else, and it shakes those reservoirs so badly that the brake fluid will actually just come up out of the cap and it makes a terrible mess and gets everywhere, especially over the driver's feet and they complain a lot. So a little bit of foam inside there, it's completely normal and we use it in a lot of the cars we do, but it's something that maybe some of you guys haven't seen before. Like everything, there's a million ways of bleeding these brakes and how I'm going to do it today is with a vacuum bleeder. It's the method I've been using for years and years and a lot of the time, if I'm stuck at the track by myself or in the workshop by myself, it's just a really easy way to get it done without the help of somebody else or somebody sitting in the car or, or whatever else. So the vacuum bleeder should pull through any air bubbles or any air locks that you, you would normally get, especially by pumping the pedal. It may sit at a high part of the brake lines like we've got on the gearbox. We've got that T-piece right up the back and then we want the brake fluid to flow back out to the calipers. It should pull that air lock out really quick. So I'm gonna get the air bleeder onto this now, vacuum it through, and then we'll, we'll see. We'll make sure we've got no leaks and we'll see if we can get the brake pedal to come up. The vacuum bleeder does pull the fluid pretty fast, so you've definitely gotta have your eyes open and make sure not to run the master cylinders dry. You can see how quickly it's pulled the fluid out of that there. But now that the brakes have bled up, the brakes have got a really nice pedal. It's, there's no leaks, everything looks really good. On the clutch side, however, when I put fluid in it, I cycled the pedal a few times to make sure the mast still didn't, didn't leak, and it started to pump the fluid through to the back of the car, and I could hear it leaking. It's obviously had a leak inside the bell housing until it got fluid into it and moved the slave cylinder out against the clutch, which I also heard the pedal went firm, bit of a click in the back, and there's just the smallest bit of residue under the bell housing, so I'm not sure what's going on, but we'll certainly keep an eye on that. The pedal's fantastic now. I'll adjust the push rod length and the stop, but I'm a little bit worried it had that initial leak. If I try really hard with two hands, I can actually get the clutch to disengage. And from, what, well, from how it feels by hand, it feels pretty good between the balance point of the clutch and where it hits the stop. I think it's somewhere near it but it's certainly something we'll have to confirm when we can get a driver in this thing. I've adjusted the push rod length so the clutch and brake pedal are the same distance, there's not one further forward or further back than the other one, and I've just adjusted the pads in the correct orientation where I think they need to be. But once again, when the fussy driver gets in there, we'll have to adjust it to what he likes and how he thinks it should feel. If you pay really close attention to this shot, you can see how close that brake bias adjuster is to the accelerator pedal as the brake pedal moves through its normal range of motion. And one of the most common complaints we get with these styles of cars, if the driver has a long brake pedal, is not that the brakes feel bad, but actually that it won't return to idle. The throttle sticks on when I'm trying to slow down. And that's exactly what it is. That brake pedal's traveling that little bit too far. The brake bias adjuster is actually hitting the accelerator pedal and bringing some RPMs on while they're trying to slow down. We're gonna keep a very close eye on that leak at the rear of the car to make sure it's not a problem because if it is, that gearbox will have to come back off the rear of the car and we basically get it to the point where it's just an engine sitting in the chassis. That'll be a massive step backwards for, we, for where we're at. Where, where we're at, just to recap, we've got fuel in it. We've got coolant in it, we've got engine oil in it. The gearbox is ready to be filled up and now we have a brake and clutch that operates. 
So we are getting really, really close to the point where we can fire this thing up. And I think on the next episode, the project we'll tackle will be the electrics because it's what's stopping us from starting this thing up. We'll get the electrics sorted and then fingers crossed we're ready for the first fire up of this thing, which should be very exciting. But thanks again to everyone for following along on this journey. Subscribe if you haven't subscribed. If you like the video, please give it a thumbs up. See you on the next video.